Okay, so we're going to start off with um, number one on the unit six assignment. Okay, so here you hopefully notice that this is something familiar is that you've got cosine uh, or a cosine function in this case here, cosine of pi x that's multiplying some other function. So since we know that cosine can never be bigger than one or less than negative one, okay, we know that this function y, okay, is going to have to be less than or equal to x squared plus one, okay, because otherwise this value would have to at some point be greater than one in order for the product to be bigger, which it never will be, and it has to be greater than or equal to negative x squared plus one, okay? So hopefully you understand that the only way for this function to be less than this number would be if cos of pi x could ever be less than negative one, which it can't be, okay? So what this does is it gives us an upper and lower bound, okay, to the function we're trying to graph. And furthermore, we know that because the maximum value of cosine is one, whenever that occurs, the whole function is going to be equal to x squared plus one, okay? And then whenever cos pi x is equal to negative one, it's going to be equal to the negative of that, okay? So it's going to have that effect of kind of going up and down uh, at the maximum points, equaling this function, or at the minimum, the negative of that function, okay? So we definitely want to know when this thing is going to have maximum and minima, and the other thing that we're going to want that's easy to find uh, and is going to help us graph this function are the x-intercepts and the sine. X-intercepts, because when cos pi x is zero, the whole thing is zero. Notice this has no x-intercepts. And the sine, because hopefully you notice that x squared plus one is always positive. So whenever cos pi x is positive, the whole function is positive. Anytime cos pi x is negative, the whole function is negative, okay? So these are the things we want to solve for. So let's start with cos pi x. <clears throat> and we know that the period of cos pi x is going to be 2 pi divided by the k value, which is pi, okay? So we know the period's going to be 2, okay? And we know that cosine, okay? because it's positive cosine, starts at the maximum and ends at the maximum for one cycle, okay? So here, I'm not even going to bother so solving an equation. I know that if this is uh, a period of two, it's going to reach the minimum at one, and it's going to be equal to zero at 0 0.5 and 1.5 and so on and so forth, okay? So any questions on this part so far on finding the specific values that are going to be useful, okay? And we know the maximum is going to occur at zero, at two, at four. The minimum is going to occur at one and three and five and so on and so forth. Okay, any questions on this part here? No? Okay, so let's now do the graph. Now, since this exists, you know, equally on both sides of the y-axis, I'm going to put my y-axis sort of straight down the middle of this graph. Okay. And I know that I'm going to be both above and below the x-axis. So it makes sense to put the x-axis right down the middle vertically. Okay. And what I'm going to want to do is graph these two functions, because that's going to then help me to, um, uh, to graph the rest, okay? So I think here, since, you know, my zeros occur at 0 0.5, 1.5, I think what I'm going to do is go up by 2, okay? So 3 and 4, okay? And here, well, I'm not going to get to 4, because 4x squared plus 1 is definitely going to be way too high, but let's say to 3, 3 squared plus 1 is 10, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, so maybe what I'll do is, just to give myself a little more breathing room, maybe what I'll do is I'll go up by 2. Okay, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and actually maybe I will be able to get to a little further up. Okay, 
So the reason why I'm choosing for this to go up um, by two is because x squared plus one is a function that grows pretty quickly. Okay, so let me draw this function and it's negative. So x squared plus one is going to have minimum of one. Okay, so at x equals one, it's going to be equal to one plus one is two. At two, it's going to be four plus one is five. Okay, and at three, it'll be three squared plus one is 10. Okay, and of course, because this is a even function, I know all these numbers are just going to repeat on the other side. Okay, and then here, there we go. And I'm just going to draw a little dotted graph of x squared plus one. This is going to be the boundary on the top. Okay. And now I'm going to do the same thing at the bottom. And again, it's just the negative. So everything's just going to be flipped over. So I don't bother recalculating. I just flip everything over. Okay. So here, this is going to be uh, 2, 4, 5. This is going to be 2, 4, 5. And then here, this is going to be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Okay. And 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Okay, so stop me if you have any questions, remember, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm just setting up my structure, okay? All right, and now I'm going to start plotting points. So I know that it's never going to go above this function, below that function. Let's start now setting up our function. So where did we say we were going to have our zeros? We're going to have our zeros at... 0.5, at 1.5, at 2.5, at 3.5, okay? And then similarly here on the other side, okay? Okay, now, where is this function gonna start? Okay, I need to start drawing this function here. And of course, at zero, I know cosine is gonna be equal to one. And at zero, this function is gonna be equal to one. So this is gonna be my starting point. And I know I've got an x-intercept here. I've got an x-intercept there. And the other thing to keep in mind, like we said earlier, is where this cosine function is positive. So on either side of x equals 0, this function is positive. I'm multiplying by a positive number, so it'll look something like this. Okay. But then in this interval here, okay, till it gets to the next x-intercept, Cosine pi x is going to be negative, so it'll look something like this. Okay, same thing on the other side. And we kind of see that it's going to now go into the positive and back down to zero, and then all the way down to this thing here and back up to zero. And that's about as far as I'm going to draw. Okay, so once I've got some, notice I kind of did it very light. And now that I have an idea of what the function looks like. There you go. I can draw it and now I can do the same thing on the other side. It's gonna go to its maximum and then here. And that'll be as good as it's gonna get, okay? Yep, so it's good to have mechanical pencil. And there you go. And put a little arrow. Okay, and so what it does is it grows over time because cos x is being multiplied by a function that grows in either direction. Okay, and that's good enough. All right, any questions here on how I went about it? Okay, so just to recap, what did I do? I recognize that I've got, oh wait, let me get a bit more light here. I just realized maybe that'll help. I realize that I've got a sinusoidal function multiplied to some other function. So because cos pi x lives between one and negative one, it's never going to be bigger than this function. It's not going to be smaller than this function. So I draw that as my boundary. <clears throat> Sorry, it's never going to be smaller than the negative of this function. So I draw those two. And then from there, I identify where cos pi x was equal to zero to get my x-intercepts. And then I determine where cos pi x is equal to one and negative one. So I know those are going to be the places where they touch. Okay. So if there's no questions on this one here, 
let's move on to number three. Okay. <clears throat> so number three asks you to again, uh, graph a combination of functions, but this time here, um, without knowing what the equations are. Okay, so I don't think I'm going to do, maybe I'll do one of them. And if we've got time, I'll do another one. The, whoever asked this one, would you like to suggest A or B? Your choice. Or if somebody else, whoever asked for number three. Nobody has a preference. I didn't ask for this, but uh, yep. A. A, okay, good. Let's do A. All right, so here, Keep in mind, this line is function f, this curve is function g, and so now what I'm trying to graph is I'm trying to graph the subtraction, which of course is defined by just subtracting the two y values, okay? Now, one of the things we determined was that in order, because remember, we'd like to find structure, and structure means some nice points, and if there happens to be, you know, things like asymptotes, that might be something useful, okay? And we remember that in order for a subtraction to be equal to zero, these two things have to be equal to each other, okay? Because a number divide, a number subtracted by itself is just going to give me zero. But since the y values need to be the same, I'm just going to look for where these functions intersect each other. So at this point here, the y values are the same. So when I subtract them, I'm going to get zero. So there we go. I know my subtraction has an x-intercept there, and there's another x-intercept somewhere around there. And those are my only x-intercepts. Now, I'm not seeing any obvious <clears throat> locations for asymptotes or holes, okay? So it doesn't look like I might have any of those. Now notice for the division, first remember I'd be looking for wherever my numerator is zero, that's where I would have an x-intercept. And wherever the denominator is zero, that's where I would expect to find a vertical asymptote. Okay, so let's go back to this one here. So we know that one of the things that happens when we're working with um, uh, um, zeros is that those are the places that the function can change sign. So that's my next, since I don't see anything that looks like it's going to give me a vertical asymptote, I'm going to now go to sign and then behavior. So let's take a look at what we have here. We have <clears throat> f, which is the first function which in this area here is always smaller than G. So that means that when I do F minus G, the result is going to be negative. But not only is it going to be negative, if I take a look at F, this seems to be increasing linearly. And I'm not exactly sure how G is increasing, but it's clearly increasing much, much, much faster than F is, okay? So I deduce from that that not only are the subtraction is all going to be negative, but that this function is going to go to negative infinity, okay? It's going to go to negative infinity, all right? So stop me if there's any questions here, because I'm subtracting a big number by some number that is getting bigger and bigger by, you know, much, much faster than these numbers are, okay? So now let's take a look at what's happening in this area here, okay? Well, now F is always bigger than G. So when I do the subtraction, I'm going to always have something that's positive, okay? So in this area here, it's going to be positive. And again, I could find, you know, some specific point. I know for sure it's going to cross 0, 2, because that's 0, 2 minus 0 is 2. So, you know, I could make it go there. It's not even necessarily the maximum but I know it's going to cross that point, but I don't even care to be that uh, precise, okay? But I know that the function is going to be positive and that it's got to come back down to zero. So now let's take a look at this section here. So again, F is always bigger, uh, sorry, always smaller than G. So I know that the subtraction is going to be, uh, is going to be, um, uh, negative. Okay, so I know in this section here, the function has to be negative. But let's start to see what happens here is as I approach negative infinity, g is starting to get 
closer and closer to zero. So I'm doing whatever F is minus something that's practically equal to zero. So I can deduce that it's going to start to look more and more like the function F. Okay. So again, why is it going to start getting closer and closer to F? Because I'm subtracting a smaller and smaller number as I go along. Okay, and so my function is going to look something like this, very likely, you know, the way it sort of curves around might be a little different. This here, I suspect would actually probably, if I had to reconsider this one here, remember what we said, we said G is getting bigger, much, much faster. It's probably going to go down more something like this. It's going to get smaller very, very quickly. Okay, and that's the pattern that I follow. Okay. Any questions on this? So if later on somebody wants me to go through the second one, if we have time, we'll do that. But I would be going through the exact same types of questions. The only difference here is I'd be considering F divided by G. All right. So next one I got here is number four. And number four is determine any symmetry, okay? So uh, I'll do 4a for now, since we did a subtraction, let's do a division, okay? Um, so this is unit six assignment, number 4b, okay? But we can go back and do 4a if we have time afterwards. And the two functions we have here are, f at x is equal to log of x squared, and then g of x is x cubed minus x, okay? And in B, what they ask us to do is determine the symmetry of uh, f over g, and f over g of x, of course, is going to be defined as f at x over g of x. So in other words, that's just going to be log of x squared over x cubed minus x, okay? So here I'm working with specific functions. So I'm gonna test the symmetry of these, this combination of these two specific functions. We also saw that you could be asked to determine the symmetry of, you know, uh, any two functions that might have a particular characteristic to them. But here, I'm just gonna work with these specific functions. Okay, so I know what f divided by g of x is equal to, but the whole uh, strategy of checking for symmetry is to compare f over g of x to f over g at negative x. So this is always what you're going to be working with. So f over g at negative x is, of course, defined at f at negative x over g at negative x. That's how a division of two functions is defined. And now I'm just going to input this into my function. So log of negative x squared. A reminder, anytime you're inputting something into an expression, always have that thing in brackets. Otherwise, you can see that you might not correctly identify what is going on. Okay, so now here I'm going to put input negative x into the denominator. So negative x cubed minus negative x. Okay. So now that I have uh, input negative x into this equation, I'm going to do some algebra and see if I can somehow compare this to the original function. Okay. So here we have log of, well, negative x all squared, of course, is just x squared. And then here, negative x all cubed is negative x cubed. And then here, minus negative x is going to end up being plus x. Okay. So I can see already that the numerators are equal to each other. The denominators as is are not exactly equal to each other, but it does look that there's something in common. Okay. It looks like if I factor out a negative one from the denominator, look what I'm left with. I'm left with x cubed minus x. And of course, here I've got positive log x squared divided by negative 
of that function. So that the negative can just be brought out and I can rewrite this as, and of course this whole thing here is just F over G at X. which we had established earlier on. And so what have we shown? We've shown that F over G at negative X is the opposite of F over G at X. So what's our conclusion? That F over G is odd. Okay. And that's the strategy that you've got. So since I had a combination of these two functions, step one was to write it out, write that combination out. But the important step for symmetry is to then calculate this function at negative x and see if you can make a comparison between these two. And we were able to do that. All right. Any questions on this here? OK. So let's move on to. Uh, so we got number six here, and there were a couple of things in number six. So let's see what they're looking for. So they give us a bunch of functions, and then they ask us to operate with them. And it looks like it's all, um, it all has to do with um, uh, composition. All right, so let's take a look. So here, we've got unit six assignment number. Six. All right. So let's. So uh, what I have here is B, E, and F. So in B, they ask us to determine J circle I at X, and here we have that uh, J is equal to, or G, J at X is equal to. Just clean that up. is equal to two to the X and I of X is equal to log base two of X. All right, so let's take a look at this here. So if I'm finding J circle I, remember my suggestion is always to rewrite it in this format using the definition. This is how J circle I is defined. And now I'm just gonna, you know, do the inside function first. So here I of X is just log base two of X. And now this becomes the input to the function j. So it's going to be 2 to the log base 2 of x. OK, so all I've done here is just apply my definition for the composition of two functions. OK, but this is where now you have to hopefully remember that there's a connection between 2 to the x and log base 2 of x. And these functions are exactly inverses of each other. And of course, what happens when you take the inverse of the function applied at x, you just get the original input out. OK, so this function j circle i at x is just equal to x. OK, now we do have to be careful though okay because when i write the function y equals x well i think of a function that's defined over all real numbers but we do have to be careful because remember when it comes to the domain of these uh, uh, composite functions it has to be in the domain of the first function and then the output has to be in the domain of the second function now the second function two to the X is defined for all real numbers, but the first function is only defined for X is greater than zero. Okay. Whatever comes out of log base two to the X, uh, of log base two of X, no problem. You can stick that into the second function, but you have this uh, condition that X has to be greater than zero. All right. Any question on this one here? No. Okay, let's go on to the next one was E. Okay, E and E is the domain of I circle F. Okay, so I, we already have uh, F at X is equal to uh, X cubed minus X. And so let me figure out what I circle F at x is equal to, so that then I can 
determine the domain. Okay, might as well write it out. Remember, I of f at x is what that is equal to. And here, f at x is x cubed minus x, and i is log base two. So it's gonna be log base two of x cubed minus x. You see here how I did it all in one shot. You know, you start to get used to that. Now, the reason why this is nice to write it this way is because now it becomes very clear. So the first function that is receiving the input is x cubed minus x, and the domain of x cubed minus x is all real numbers, so there's no restrictions on the first function. But the restrictions come when I input this into the second function, and we know that log base 2 of x can only take positive numbers. So x cubed minus x has to be greater than 0. This is what I have to uh, work with. And of course, what can I do here is I can just factor. First, I find a common factor. Then I can factor the difference of squares. And so what I have is this polynomial inequality. And our strategy for solving a polynomial inequality is to use the graph to determine the particular sign we're interested in, in this case here, positive. So I draw my number line. I include my x-intercepts. In this case here, there's nothing like an asymptote involved. So it's only the x-intercepts. Since it has to be greater than zero, I'm not interested in including any of those x-intercepts. And lastly, I use the leading coefficient and the uh, degree to determine the end behavior. So, so this is a cubic polynomial with a positive leading coefficient. Notice all the zeros are order one. So I know my function looks like this. Okay. And so now from the graph, I can read the answer that I'm looking for. The domain of I circle F is just going to be equal to well, let's see what we have. It's positive in this interval here. So negative one to zero. And then this portion here when X is greater than one. Okay. And now we've seen this a few times. Okay. It's always this two-step process. What's happening with the first function? See if there's any restrictions. Then take the output of the first function and check for any restrictions from the second function. All right, any uh, questions from this here? Does it matter what notation you use for the answer? No, no, of course. I'm using uh, interval notation. You're perfectly welcome to use um, uh, to use um, uh, set notation with the curly brackets and the, uh, um, what do you call that? The inequality symbols, that's all perfect, okay? But you should use one of those two scenarios, okay? Anything else on this one here? Now, somebody asked for F. Did I actually assign F yet? Something tells me I didn't assign. So if I didn't assign it, I'd rather give people some more time to uh, play with it. Let's see here. Let's see, did I assign F? No, I didn't assign that one yet. So let me give people um, time to work on that. All right. So uh, let me know. So somebody's just asking something about 4A, which I don't think I did. So if there's a question with 4A, we can take a look at that. What about this graph here? Does uh, anybody need me to go through that? So somebody's saying for 4A, it says that there is no symmetry. So it could just very well be that in 4A, I think we were looking at, uh, 4A, we were looking at F minus G. It could be that F minus G was neither equal to uh, F minus G of negative X, or it wasn't equal to the negative of F minus G uh, of negative x, in which case there's no symmetry. But I can I can do it if people want. So quickly, folks, do you want me to do 4a? Do you want me to do uh, 3b? 
Okay, so 4a, we've got that. What about 3b? No, okay, so we'll just do uh, 4a and then we'll end it there. Okay. <clears throat> so 4a, uh, let me write the you write the functions again. So here, this is a unit six assignment number four a. Okay, so again, we have f at x was equal to log of x squared. And then here we had g of x is equal to x cubed minus x. All right, so this time here, we're looking at f minus g of x. Okay. So again, like as before, let's see what f minus g of x actually looks like. Okay, so f, this is defined as f at x minus, minus g of x. Okay, and what's that equal to? Well, it's log base, a uh, log of x squared minus g of x, which is x cubed minus x. Make sure you're putting that in bracket. As I said, anything that gets inputted so this is minus x cubed plus x, okay? So this is what f minus g of x looks like. Let's now calculate f minus g at negative x and see if we can relate it to this here, okay? So f minus g at negative x is again, f at x, my, uh, sorry, f at negative x minus g at negative x. f at negative x is log of negative x squared minus, oops, not equal to, sorry, minus uh, negative x cubed minus negative x. Okay, you gotta be careful with all these brackets. And so here, what do we have? This becomes log of x squared, as we saw before. And then here we have, negative x cubed, okay, plus x. And so let's now keep simplifying. This is plus x cubed minus x. And now let's see if we can make some comparison. So clearly these two things are not equal to each other. So it's not an even function. But if I tried to factor out a negative one, in order to get these uh, operations to be the same, I would end up having a negative in front of log of x squared. So neither are they negatives of each other, okay? Because let's say you have to multiply this by negative one, okay? I would get negative log of x squared plus x cubed minus x. So here, since f minus g at x is not equal to f minus g at negative x, and it's not equal to negative f minus g at negative x, okay? The conclusion is that there is no symmetry, okay? Even though these two functions themselves have symmetry, if you were to calculate that, you would see that this is an even function, that that's an odd function. There's no guarantee that an operation on these two functions will have symmetry. We saw that with division, there was, but with subtraction, there's no symmetry, okay? All right, any other questions we wanna ask? No, okay, so we'll call it a night. We'll see you all uh, tomorrow. And uh, we should have some time in class to spend some more time working on the assignment. If you have any other questions, you can ask uh, later or ask tomorrow.